the birth of consciousness always necessarily begins with division, with a rupturing apart of the primordial embryonic oneness within which there is not yet any distinction between the subjective interiority of the child and the body of the mother. The death of oneness is the birth of boundaries and the birth of individuality. This is a pattern which we see encapsulated and exemplified within the process of biological birth and which we see elaborated, unfolded, and particularized throughout the psychic development of the human organism. Carl Jung referred to this psychic development as the individuation process, and Joseph Campbell later developed this individuation process into what we now know as the myth cycle, or hero's journey. Much like the process of biological birth, this is a process of separation followed by reunification. As the human psyche matures, it faces challenges which force it to relinquish its dependencies upon the mother, the family, and the community. Through facing alienation, danger, loneliness, and agony, we are forced to develop a sense of independence, self-efficacy, self-reliance, and individuality. It was this basic dynamic which Sigmund Freud, albeit in a characteristically awkward manner, saw within what he called the Oedipus Complex. Separation is also the root of desire, a kind of longing for return to the comforts of the primordial oneness from which we originated, a desire to relinquish our powers and responsibilities unto an island of safety and maternal warmth. Freud was quite correct in seeing that for the male psyche, libidinality begins with this desire for return, which originally manifests as a desire for the comforts provided by one's mother. If you've ever spent any time around toddler boys and seen how they act towards their mothers, then you've probably noticed that it seems like they would probably crawl back into the womb if they could. This is, at best, a very slight exaggeration, but as fate would have it, they cannot. And moreover, mothers simply cannot provide for every constant need of the child. Mothers get tired, bored, or agitated, and mothers are, much to the dismay of their toddler sons, human beings who have other things to do. As such, the boy is forced to explore his world, to stray from the comforts provided by the mother and to ascertain how to meet his own needs. As this process develops, the boy's unconscious psyche becomes aware of a certain imbalance, which will then shape the manner in which this infantile libidinality will evolve into mature sexuality later in life. The child begins to think, at a very unconscious level, something along the lines of, I desire mother, but she does not desire me, at least not in the same way. The mother may certainly love her child, but the boy has essentially nothing that the mother actually needs. And yet the child will observe that the mother does in fact have desires, the object of these desires will come to coalesce within the child's mind as the unconscious image of the archetypal father. The boy will come to see that in order to resolve this perceived imbalance, he must acquire the characteristics of the father image in the hopes of coming to possess within himself that which can allow him to become an object of desire for that which is desired. The archetypal mother, which through subsequent developments, will cease to be identified exclusively with one's actual biological mother and will instead come to be projected onto others who are better candidates for the reciprocation of the boy's desires. The son comes to strive towards becoming the father. And in doing so, the triad of father, mother, and child will eventually come to recreate itself, unless the process comes to be distorted or malformed. Within this process, the human ego comes to develop as the sense of lack evolves so as to become a sense of separate selfhood and individual autonomy. 
the ego can be understood as a kind of organ of the human soul, one which is a locus of self-efficacy and individuality, but also one of anxiety, paranoia, and the will to power. Within Shenji Akari, the protagonist of Neon Genesis Evangelion, we see this dynamic manifested in an acutely distorted manner. Shinji is a 14-year-old boy who is seen to be contending with an immensely acute inner turmoil regarding his own individuation. Shinji's mother, Yui Akari, is said to have died in a laboratory accident when Shinji was very young. Shinji's father, Gendo Akari, is the director of a military technological organization known as NERV, which is tasked with protecting the world from the cataclysmic dangers which have beset it, but which is also intent upon the realization of its own secretive agendas. Rather than seeing his father as an admirable role model, Shinji instead feels an immense sense of alienation and even fear regarding Gendo. Throughout the series, we see that Gendo is an extremely domineering, cold, and calculative figure who sees Shinji himself as little more than a means to his ends. Shinji is, in fact, absolutely crucial to the mission of the Nerve organization. Within the world of Evangelion, the planet Earth has undergone a cataclysmic event known as the Second Impact resulting in the deaths of many billions of human beings, melting of the polar ice caps, and instigating a devastating nuclear war. Following this second impact, the Earth is then beset by alien beings, referred to as angels, which threaten to destroy humanity entirely. Humanity's only defense against these creatures are equally Lovecraftian, quasi-biological mechas known as evas. These mechas can only be effectively piloted by certain individuals born after the Second Impact event, whose unique capacities for cognitive synchronization allow them to link their minds with the EVAs. Shinji himself possesses far greater synchronization capabilities than any other EVA pilot, meaning that he will be pivotal in the struggle for humanity's survival. Shinji, however, is crushed by the demands and expectations which have been foisted upon him. He finds himself required to live up to the expectations of a father who he feels intensely alienated from, and to protect a world which seems hardly worth preserving. As the narrative progresses, we see Shinji come to be consumed by increasingly acute inner turmoil as he must navigate between his will to individuation, life, maturation, strength, and connection to other human beings, and his will to abdicate his responsibilities, reject those around him, and abandon life itself. Two of the most significant figures who will come to reflect the turmoil of Shinji's inner world will be his fellow Eva pilots, Rei Ayanami and Asuka Langley, and it's here that we can begin to decipher the archetypal dynamics at play within both Shinji's psyche as well as the overall narrative of Evangelion as a whole. Among the various archetypal figures addressed within Carl Jung's psychodynamic theories is that which Jung would refer to as the anima, a Latin word which approximately corresponds to the English soul. As I have argued in other videos, all of the archetypes explicated by Jung, such as the shadow, trickster, and senex, are in fact the various guises or manifestations of the soul, or higher self. They are the various forms taken by the soul in its attempts to direct or communicate with the ego. The anima can be understood as a kind of mirror image of the ego. It is what the ego is not, and thus the anima or animus always manifests as the opposite gender of the individual. The anima is what we feel we are not and feel we cannot be and thus what we wish to reclaim through connection with other human beings. The anima is therefore in many ways an archetypal image of romantic and sexual desire. With Rei Ayanami, this symbolic role is quite unambiguous. 
Rey is typically calm, quiet, brooding, and passive. She represents the maternal femininity, which represents for Shinji his desire for maternal comfort and disengagement from the demands which the world has made of him. Moreover, it is revealed over the course of the narrative that Rei is in fact a clone of Shinji's mother. Rei is quite literally a living representation of the warm maternal oneness which Shinji feels to have been unjustly robbed from him, and therefore a representation of his will to reject life in favor of a return to such a pre-egoic state. With Asuka Langley, we see a further complexification of Shinji's psyche, with another kind of mirroring of Shinji's own ego. Just as Shinji lost his mother at a very young age, so did Asuka. However, the two characters have dealt with this loss in diametrically opposed manners. Shinji, as we have already begun to see, has dealt with his loss largely by retreating from the world feeling himself to be weak, incompetent, and unable to be truly present in relation to the challenges he is faced with. Asuka, conversely, has become headstrong, abrasive, and uninhibited. Due to this mirroring, Asuka essentially comes to serve the role of a second anima. Rei, in accordance with the traditional function of the anima, represents the feminine aspects which Shinji's masculine ego lacks. Asuka, however, instead represents the masculine qualities which Shinji's ego has failed to develop. Asuka is in many ways much more competent, individualistic, and self-assured than Shinji, facts which Shinji finds humiliating despite the fact that there is, appropriately enough, an immense amount of romantic and sexual tension between the two. In archetypal terms, Rei and Asuka represent the two halves of Shinji's fractured self. More specifically, Rei and Asuka represent, respectively, the lunar and solar aspects of Shinji's higher self. Rei is explicitly associated with the moon within the plot of Evangelion. The moon represents femininity, blood, the mother-child relationship, familial bonds, nocturnal rumination, and one's connection to the past. The sun, conversely, represents the higher ideals which guide the human psyche forward through the process of individuation. The lunar archetype represents the self as an inextricably interconnected, relational entity, while the solar archetype represents the self as a unique individuality which exists independently of such interrelations. If you've been following my channel for a while, then you will probably be familiar with this diagram, the astrochromogram which I have used as a tool for mapping out the various relationships between psychological, alchemical, mythical, and astrological archetypes. As we can see here, the moon is adjacent to Mercury, indicating an affinity between the lunar personality and mercurial tendencies, such as thoughtfulness, ideation, and detachment, all qualities which we see expressed by Rey. Adjacent to Mercury, we then have Neptune, which corresponds to the archetypal mother, and tendencies of fantasy, escapism, spiritual ecstasy, and, within the context of Evangelion, Shinji's deceased mother and the idyllic, embryonic oneness which she has come to represent. Looking then to the solar archetype, we can see an affinity between the solar will, which strives towards the realization of higher ideals, and the Martian archetype, the archetype of action, agency, conflict, and transformation, which we see expressed in Asuka's headstrong assertiveness and self-determination. Adjacent to Mars, we then have the Plutonic archetype, representing the sense of separation itself and the various forms of primal anxiety, paranoia, rage, and sexual eros, which emerge from that sense of separation which divides the human self from the world it inhabits. Thus, we can see it is immensely appropriate that Asuka should be the primary object of both Shinji's projected self-hatred and his sexual desires. Rei represents what Shinji is not, but the lack represented by Rei is one which Shinji wishes to reclaim, not what he wishes to be. 
With Asuka, on the other hand, we see a representation of the qualities which Shinji feels he is unable to embody within himself. She is a constant reminder of his own inadequacy. Conversely, Asuka herself is deeply alienated from her own femininity, and thus Shinji represents for her everything she wishes herself to be, but which she feels the world will not allow her to be. There is no one to protect her and thus allow her to let down her guards and thus allow herself to be the bubbly, whimsical teenage girl which she is beneath the protective layers of Martian, solar individualism, assertiveness, and aggression. For most narrative protagonists, there is only room for one anima or animus, but with Shinji, we see the anima split into two archetypal figures, specifically due to the self-perceived inadequacy within Shinji, which is the driving psychological force of the Evangelion narrative. The anima, a manifestation of the soul, manifests in a bifurcated manner due to the fact that Shinji's own soul has been likewise cleaved in half. Although we see indications of the Plutonic archetype within Asuka herself and in the relationship between Asuka and Shinji, we see this Plutonic power even more fully embodied by the Evas themselves. The Evas represent the primal aggression, visceral paranoia, and animalistic libido of the unconscious realm. The Plutonic archetype is fundamentally the sense of self-world separation, the sense of separation which comes about through the process of birth, the rupturing apart of the embryonic Neptunian oneness. This sense of separation is existential anxiety itself but it is also the will to life which emerges from this sense of separation. As we have already begun to see, this anxiety can manifest as a will to return to the state of gestational oceanic unity, a will which comes to manifest as sexual desire, but it also comes to manifest as a will to protect and maintain the boundaries which separate self from world. The dissolving of those boundaries can occur within sexual climax or within spiritual ecstasy, but the dissolving of such boundaries is also death itself, quite literally the reversal of the birthing process. Moving along now to Shinji's father, Gendo Akari, we can see that Gendo embodies both the Saturnian and Jovian principles. Jupiter is, of course, the archetypal father and represents the success, abundance, strength, and prestige of the archetypal king. Saturn then represents the inertia, momentum, or conservatism through which the past comes to perpetuate itself into the future and thereby constrain the freedom of the present. Saturn and Jupiter together can thus be seen here to represent the demands and expectations of the world which Shinji experiences as crushing burdens, and which are epitomized by Shinji's relationship with his father. The character Misato Katsuragi can then be seen to embody the Venusian archetype, the archetypal queen in polar contrast to the Jovian archetypal king. Unlike Shinji and his anima counterparts, Masato is a competent adult. She is the operations director of the nerve organization and as such commands authority and respect. Masato represents the ideals of regal, feminine beauty, but simultaneously we also come to see that her personal life is noticeably disorganized, unkempt, and libertine, in stark contrast with the disciplinary professionalism of her outward persona. As such, we can see that Masato represents not only Venusian regality, but also the liberation of adulthood the power to let go of the worries of the world and to have a control over one's own personal life, which Shinji and the other Eva pilots conspicuously lack. This lure of liberation thus corresponds to the archetype of Uranus, which we can see to be directly adjacent to Venus. 
Uranus resides in polar opposition to the disciplinary, institutional power structures represented by Saturn, the very structures of authority and control which Masato is required to navigate in her professional life. Masato's personal life thus represents a Uranian refusal of this Saturnian power, although this rebellion must be sequestered within the confines of a personal life which has been sharply divided from the professional world by the modern cultural dynamics of corporate and governmental bureaucracy. But this Uranian archetype is embodied even more fully within the monstrous angels. Uranus represents the celestial fires from beyond the firmament, the fires brought down by Prometheus which allowed human civilization to break free from its primeval oneness with nature. Uranus is the archetype of combustion, rebellion, liberation, and the annihilation of solidified structures. It is the process whereby inner tensions, frictions, or contradictions attempt to resolve themselves through explosive transformation, and the breakdown of established normalcy. As will become clear moving forward, the angels of Evangelion represent the violent ingression of a celestial, transcendental realm into the mundane world which has come to embody an order which stands in deep contradiction to the order or logos of that transcendental realm. That then leaves us with two remaining archetypes, those of transcendental light and primordial darkness, and thus brings us to one of the most central metaphysical concepts within the Evangelion narrative, the AT field. Throughout Evangelion we see these absolute terror fields, depicted as force field-esque barriers, which can be manipulated in a wide variety of ways by angels, evas, and even human beings. Later we come to learn that the AT field is in fact a quasi-physical manifestation of the metaphysical barrier which separates individual souls from the rest of the cosmos. These barriers are quite literal representations of the plutonic separation which conditions the sense of distinct individuality that is the soul. The terror gestured towards by the term AT field is the plutonic separation anxiety. As such, the capacity to manipulate and wield the power of the AT field is correlated with what is termed synchronization rate within the franchise. This synchronization rate seems to contain an implicit connotation of the Jungian notion of synchronicity, and we can see that fundamentally this synchronization rate refers to the connection between one's consciousness and the primordial oneness of the collective unconscious. The greater this connection between the personal and the transpersonal consciousness is, the more malleable the barrier is between self and world, and thus the more wieldable the AT field becomes for that individual. Implicit within the concept of the AT field is that of an underlying primordial consciousness, within which all life is interconnected. We could of course understand this implied oneness to be God, and this is accurate but not quite specific enough. More precisely, we can understand this oneness to be a state of undifferentiation, which underlies or ontologically precedes the universe the pleroma as described within the Gnostic tradition, the wuji as described within Taoist cosmology, the undivided waters which precede the birth of the cosmos within Sumerian mythology, or what the Swiss philosopher Jean Gebser referred to as the ever-present origin. Throughout all of these traditions we see this pleroma described as an absolutely fundamental and ever-present unity of all things. It is, in a sense, the collective unconscious, but it is also that which underlies and conditions the reality of the collective unconscious. Moreover, it is understood to be a luminous darkness, within which transcendental light and imminent shadow remain as yet undifferentiated. It is through the rupturing apart of this primeval oneness, 
through the initial self-sacrifice of God that the cosmos comes to be born, the archaeogenesis, as it were. Here we can also begin to see the significance of Shinji's psychosexual malaise in relation to the metaphysical structure of Evangelion's narrative. Shinji's inability to properly individuate is precisely due to the fact that he has never managed to come to terms with the loss of his mother. He continues to cling to his longing for the comfort and security represented by his mother as he does not feel that this separation was brought out through his own agency. The separation was not a voluntary engagement with the world through which Shinji came to psychologically mature, but rather, the separation was something that he felt to be unjust and tragic, a trauma which he was utterly powerless to prevent. Shinji is unable and unwilling to manifest within himself the values which are needed in order for him to accord with the challenges and expectations of the world because he feels that the order of the world and the values implied by that order are the same destructive and pathological powers which robbed him of his mother. Shinji thus feels compelled to reject a world which he simply does not and cannot believe in, and therefore Shinji finds himself pulled by the allure of the abyss, of the divine maternal darkness within the Pleroma. Due to this unconscious will to return, Shinji, despite the apparent failings of his ego individuation, has developed a much stronger connection with the unconscious oneness which underlies his sense of individual selfhood, a connection which we see depicted in the narrative as his unusually impressive synchronization rate. If this dynamic sounds familiar, it's because we see this very same dynamic quite often within the real world, particularly within many troubled geniuses whose psychological malaise has likewise conditioned a relationship to the collective unconscious which has allowed them to create immensely moving works of art, poetry, music, or philosophy. Shinji's ability to control the biomechanical Eva-1 and the AT field are thus secondary manifestations of the same psychological complex, which intimately connects him to the fate of humanity itself within the overall narrative of Evangelion, a narrative within which the tensions between separation and oneness are expressed at a truly cosmological scale. The narrative of Evangelion can be divided into three distinct phases, demarcated by the three impact events. The first impact is revealed to be the arrival of the primordial beings, Adam and Lilith, on the planet Earth. These primordial beings contained within themselves a seed of life, which would allow them to create new life on the planets they arrived upon. The backstory which we are presented with is that the Earth itself was originally intended to be inseminated by Adam, but due to some sort of mistake, Lilith came to Earth as well and would come to create human life on Earth while Adam became trapped between the glacial ice sheets of Antarctica. The second impact then was actually initiated by human beings, specifically by the mysterious organization known as Sile who attempted to free Adam from the Antarctic ice sheets in order to further their plot to achieve human instrumentality, the unification of all human beings into a kind of hive mind or super organism. Following the cataclysmic events of the Second Impact, the beings known as Angels began to arrive on Earth in an effort to destroy Lilith and humanity and thereby claim the Earth as their rightful inheritance. The third impact then refers to the process by which humanity would come to transcend its state of separation into distinct individuals and become a unified superorganism. As we come to learn, humanity itself is in fact an angel, the 18th angel. It is also stated that the angel's genetic makeup is almost identical to that of humans, and that the angels are in fact humans who have rejected human form. It is indicated that all angels, including human beings from Earth, begin with a sort of egg or chrysalis. 
The children of Adam, however, seem to have foregone the human phase of their development so as to achieve the biomechanical superorganism form directly. The third impact to be brought about by the Human Instrumentality Project would be the initiation of a kind of metamorphosis, through which humanity would likewise come to achieve such a biomechanical, superorganismic state. The separate individualities of humanity would come to be dissolved into a singular unity. Within this third impact, we therefore see the same will to oneness of Shinji's personal psychology expressed at the scale of humanity as a whole. The mysterious Sile organization sees humanity's multiplicity as a state which is fallen beyond any hope of rectification, and thus sees the unification of the third impact as the only path forward for achieving liberation from this fallenness, and ultimately ensuring humanity's survival within a cosmos which seems imminently hostile. The choice which Shinji is faced with is thus the same choice which humanity itself is faced with. To embrace the anxiety, pain, uncertainty, and alienation of individual selfhood, or to answer the call of the void, and relinquish our souls unto a transcendental oneness. Many other commentators have suggested that this will unto the disavowal of life is a distinctly Gnostic motif. And indeed, there are similarities here with the metaphysics and spirituality of Gnosticism. But such commentators very often seem to miss the point here, largely because it seems that such commentators, as with most commentators on Gnosticism more generally, tend to only possess a very fleeting familiarity with Gnosticism itself. It is rather misleading, in my opinion, to characterize Gnosticism as simply an outright disavowal of the bodily, natural world. The truth is much more complicated, and as such, a detailed exposition on Gnosticism itself is going to have to be a video for another day. For now, however, what is significant here is that this life disavowal is a tendency which we see expressed in some form or another and to varying degrees within almost every single spiritual tradition throughout the world. We certainly see this impulse to some extent within Gnosticism, but we also see it as a prominent undercurrent within later forms of Christianity. Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, and many forms of religious and mystical traditions. The driving force underlying this tendency towards life disavowal is an acknowledgement of the fact that the order of the natural world seems to be so deeply incongruent with the idyllic world of the transcendental, celestial realm. And in many ways, the rejection of this order seems quite sensible. Shinji's unwillingness to accord with the demands of his father and the nerve organization is not merely a failing on the part of Shinji. The values implied by these structures of violence, espionage, and bureaucratic power seem hardly worthy of admiration and emulation. If the world is to be affirmed, therefore, rather than unborn, then it must somehow be redeemed. It must be reborn in such a manner that this process of cataclysmic death and rebirth can bring the order of the bodily, human world into accordance with the world of higher ideals. The beings Adam and Lilith here represent divine light and divine darkness the masculine and feminine polarities of the Pleroma, which must somehow be reconciled through this transformation. Within the climax of Evangelion, Rey comes to merge with Lilith, thus initiating Sile's human instrumentality plan and the Third Impact. Rey's body thus becomes the vessel for the multitude of human souls on Earth, which begin to merge with her. Within the franchise, we are told that the angels have been sent to Earth in order to destroy humanity and reclaim it as their rightful home. However, this is a story in which Nerve and Sile are both very unreliable narrators, and I find that in many ways this explanation doesn't quite add up. In fact, there are a number of claims within the official narrative which don't really make sense here. 
First of all, the story presented by Nerve and Sile indicates that there was an initial mistake which was made which resulted in Lilith giving birth to humanity on the planet Earth. The planet was designated for Adam alone, but through some accident, both beings came to arrive on the planet. It is said that all such ancestral deities possess a lance of Longinus in order to kill another such being which arrives upon a planet which they have laid claim to. But we only ever see Adam's lance of Longinus. It is suggested that Lilith's lance was lost somehow, but this is never explained. This narrative also implies that both Adam and Lilith are essentially female and therefore that they gave birth to the angels through a kind of parthenogenesis. Yet Adam is the only one of the two which possesses the obviously phallic Lance of Longinus, and the name given to the creature is also quite obviously a male name. This narrative also doesn't seem to explain why the angels only began to attack Earth after the second impact, that is, after Sile set its plans for human instrumentality in motion. If they were the rightful inheritors of the Earth, then why didn't they just wipe out life on Earth long before humanity developed the technological capabilities needed to defend against them? My suspicion here is that this version of the narrative is actually a complete fabrication, intentionally devised by Nerve and Sile in order to obfuscate the nature of their own true intentions. All of the angels, including humanity, were the children of both the male Adam and the female Lilith. The extraterrestrial angels did not reject their humanity. Rather, they were never meant to be the vessels of separate, individuated souls at all. That destiny was meant for humanity alone. There was no second Lance of Longinus because only the male of each pair of ancestral beings possesses such a lance, in this case, Adam. The reason why both Lilith and Adam lay dormant beneath the surface of the Earth prior to the second impact was because they came to Earth together quite intentionally in order to seed humanity, just as they had done so previously in seeding the other angels on other planets. Adam and Lilith simply descended into hibernation after having created humanity, as humanity was the final product of this creative endeavor. The extraterrestrial angels were not, in fact, attempting to destroy humanity, but rather to free Lilith, and thus subvert Sile's plans to achieve human instrumentality. The extraterrestrial angels began coming to Earth following the so-called Second Impact, because it was through this event that Sile set its plans in motion to achieve human instrumentality. Sile planned to recombine the life-generative powers of Lilith and Adam so as to synthesize humanity into a unified superorganism, the Third Impact. If Lilith and Adam reproduced separately via parthenogenesis, then why did Sile need to recombine Adam with Lilith in order to achieve this instrumentality? If Sile actually achieved human instrumentality, in doing so, it would have subverted the cosmic destiny of humanity itself, as human beings alone were destined to be vessels for separate, individual souls which are capable of the spiritual freedom which humanity shares with the Godhead, and which the other angels lack. The angels, therefore, were not attempting to destroy humanity but rather to save humanity from Sile's human instrumentality project. The dynamics at play here are indicated within the use of the term instrumentality itself. A common theme throughout Evangelion is the blurring of boundaries between the biological and the mechanistic. And we should notice here that among all the angelic children of Adam and Lilith, humanity alone seems to be purely biological with all the other angels being partially, if not almost entirely, mechanical physiologically. Unlike living organisms, machines lack autonomy and agency. They do what they are designed to do. Likewise, within Christian theology, it is said that angels lack human freedom, a power which humanity alone shares with God. 
the mechanical nature of the angels, therefore, seems to be a symbolic indication of this lack of autonomy. These are beings which serve a higher purpose, but which lack the power to create and actualize their own aims. Machines are, of course, instruments. Thus, the notion of human instrumentality suggests that the merging together of humanity into a singular, presumably biomechanical superorganism would therefore dissolve human freedom, transforming us into a kind of mechanical being which is unburdened by the turmoils, which necessarily accompany such individual autonomy. From the perspective of Sile, this dissolution of the human soul would be an act of ultimate liberation. In relation to the divine will, however, which the angels are driven by, this dissolution would subvert the ultimate purpose of humanity. The achievement of a numinosity through the incarnation of God's universal cosmic freedom within the imminent particularity of the individual human soul. Within the final scenes of Evangelion, we see this cosmic battle between life affirmation and life denial come to converge with the very same dynamics of Shinji's own psychological interior. Within this final apocalyptic confrontation, the process of human instrumentality begins to subsume the souls of humanity into the colossal, super-organismic body of Rei, who now serves as a vessel within which the life-creating powers of Adam and Lilith have been artificially rejoined. Within these final scenes, the boundary between the psychological and the physical itself begins to dissolve. The events of the climax itself come to be ever less coherent as the inner, subjective worlds of the characters seem to spill over into the external, intersubjective world. Shinji pilots Ava-1 into Rei's superhuman body, merging his own consciousness with hers. The bodies of all human beings on Earth begin to dissolve into a substance called LCL, a liquid which is used within the cockpits of the Ava units and which is implied to be the embryonic fluid of Lilith herself. The innumerable souls of humanity are then gathered up by Rey and begin to be incorporated into her body. Within this much longed-for state of embryonic oneness, Shinji sees that the souls of humanity complete each other, and are thus at peace. But he also begins to see that this form of existence is ultimately empty. The beauty of connection requires separation. Within this state of primordial oneness, there can be no such beauty. Love requires the symbiosis of things which are different, and without such differentiation, what we are left with is not love, but rather merely tranquil, static anesthesia. Shinji finally comes to see that, in spite of everything, the agonies of separation must be accepted and embraced in order to affirm the underlying purposiveness of life itself. He relinquishes himself from the embrace of Rei's super-organic body and returns to Earth, allowing Ava-1 to drift into deep space and thus allowing the individual human souls within Rei to choose whether they wish to remain within this state or to return to their existence as individual beings on Earth. Within the final scene, we see only Shinji and Asuka, surrounded by an ocean of the embryonic LCL fluid. Within these final moments, we are not presented with an ultimate resolution or closure, but rather a moment of immense emotional turmoil which shows us that the frictions of desire, compassion, and animosity yet remain between the two characters and thus also within the individual souls of the characters. And yet, this is an ending in which this friction of difference is affirmed, not rejected. Despite how agonizing Shinji's relationship with Asuka might be, it is in this moment that we see clearly that Shinji's ultimate decision was to accept the radical otherness of Asuka and to carry on with life. Shinji has chosen rebirth rather than unbirth, 
and we are left to speculate as to what a reborn humanity will come to be in the aftermath of this apocalypse. All right, everyone, so thank you so much for watching, but before I end this, I do want to make another quick plug for the webinar courses we are going to be starting in May. These are weekly Zoom sessions you can sign up for and which we'll be going through different philosophical texts, which I think are absolutely incredible, but which you probably wouldn't hear much about at all within a typical university education. So the whole project of these webinars is to take exciting ideas that are well off the beaten path and make them accessible to anyone who wants to expand their own horizons. If you want to learn more about these courses or sign up for one, then check out our website, formscapes.org. There will be a link in the description box as well as on the main channel page. Starting in May, we are going to be going over the question concerning technology and other essays by Martin Heidegger, The Phenomenon of Man by Teilhard de Chardin, The Philosophy of Freedom by Rudolf Steiner, and The Reflexive Universe by Arthur M. Young. So, thanks again to everyone who signed up for the previous courses we started in March. Thanks to everyone who has supported this project on Patreon and the YouTube memberships. And thanks to everyone who has taken the time to engage with the work that I've been trying to create here. I'll see you next time.